afternoon, everyone, and hello. Um, here's Caroline my, and Mary and me. Um, I'm Tony. Um, for my sins, I started AIMSEC a while ago, and I think most of you do know who I am. So I'm going to hand over to Caroline to introduce herself. Hello everyone, my name is Caroline and I am the founder of Bubbly Maths. Our mission is that every child on earth will love learning and enjoy mathematics and that includes children in the remotest parts of the world as well as the children in, in cities and in, mostly focused on the ones that have difficulty, have anxiety or hate maths or struggle with maths and that includes helping the parents, helping the teachers and re, um, in, improve them that's why I'm working with Tony because she's the best and and it's my pleasure to be here and to be doing these workshops every month thank you Mary over to you thank you thank you Tony and Caroline and uh, thank you to all of you that have made time to be here this afternoon and evening for some of us uh, I'm Mary Ocheng I was a high, a high school teacher for a long time and um uh, I love teaching mathematics and what drew, what has drawn me to these kind of things is um, I've always wanted to make the, keep the learning of mathematics meaningful for the people that I teach. And so that's why I'm here. Yeah. Yes, we're very lucky to have Mary with us. And so we're going to go on uh, to talk about how you can use paper sticks and you can use them in lessons for all ages, from little ones, preschool, right up to school leaving age and beyond. So if you want to do the activities, you need paper sticks. Um, if you haven't got them, well, you'll have to manage with that. You can use pen and paper. But we're all grown ups, we can do it on pen and paper. The theme is for all ages. And the theme is making maths with unit lengths, the unit lengths being our paper sticks. Now we've talked before about the learning spiral. This is lifelong learning from birth right through to the end of our lives. There's always something new to learn and that's how, well that's what makes life interesting. But as teachers, we're particularly concerned with the section of this learning spiral in school, for the school ages, and that's what we're talking about today. So the activities today, we're going to take by stages, going up this spiral, we're going to start with an activity for the very small children, and it's one that everybody can do together in any lesson and it's a four triangles puzzle and then we're going to go on to a challenge for four to seven year olds lower primary another challenge for upper primary on making um, meter sticks and then using them in all sorts of ways and then we're going to go on to a challenge for secondary called Loopy Challenge 2, where we'll be looking at area, perimeter and factors. So although it's a bit wild making things from paper sticks, it's all connected with the school maths curriculum. And then for the upper secondary, still paper sticks, puzzles, why shouldn't you have do practical things when you're, you know, almost grown up at seven, 16, 17, 18. And we're going to be talking about symmetries in two dimensions and three, and then a tiny little bit about where that leads beyond school. And there are some links, don't worry about them now, but there are lots of resources there, including eight videos about things you can do in the classroom with paper sticks. The one I'm going to show you today is just made with ordinary scrap paper. Uh, and the other things you'll need are some cello tape, some scissors and some string. Now we'll just fold the piece of paper in half and cut it to make our paper stick. 
and I've just got this one which I'm going to use now. Now I'm going to fold the strip of paper in three. It doesn't have to be absolutely exact, near enough in three. Then I'm going to tape my piece of string in the middle. And the reason for doing this is that if I do that, just secure it there, it won't pull out later on when I've made the stick. Now, we just roll it as tightly as we possibly can. Keep rolling and keep it as tight as you can. You can always start again if it comes to it. There we go. That's needs all it needs now is to be secured and we find the best thing to do is to make the cello tape go all the way around so that it will stop it coming unrolled. Just get six of them. You're gonna get two of your sticks and just well get all of your sticks but simply join them together by tying Two knots that's what you want to make just tie five sticks together to make that so you've got two triangles tie your five sticks together and think and you can while you're doing it think about how you could use these sticks in your classroom they're just made with a piece of string a piece of recycled paper newspaper and a bit of sticky tape and we we've, we've got lots of different shapes we do them we've got lots of different puzzles and you see lots of them today take that that you've made and using one more stick the challenge is it works with all ages it's just and um, we want to make is four triangles with the younger learners what you'll find is they'll put the stick there they'll put the stick there they'll put it across like this and these are great opportunities to differentiate between triangles and the the other shapes which are quadrilaterals but they're not regular quadrilaterals if you get it exactly right you can get um you get other shapes but the other thing is to point out for example if it goes right across the, the center there it doesn't make any triangles because the triangles are closed 2d shape and if you can put your finger in between it's not closed so it's a nice opportunity to demonstrate that and then eventually uh, what I do is I just attach it at the end so then they can maybe start being a little adventurous and they discover that by going into three dimensions they can have four triangles and they're all the same shape they're all the same length every vertex has the same number of edges or triangles attached so they're making triangular base pyramid so there it is the tetrahedron all made up and it's the same two triangles add one more stick and you've got four triangles and they're all the same doesn't seem just... possible when you see two triangles and then you're told you've got to make four with one extra stick. And then as you're going along, you can set up displays in your classroom of the different ones and find out what they're called, look at their properties, make a poster of them as well that goes with it that talks about their properties. So we'll, we'll do that more of that later. It doesn't take long to make the sticks. I believe that you can, if you use a reef knot, um, it's a very simple knot. It's something that I learned when I was a child in the Girl Guides. Um, then you can easily undo the strings and use the sticks again. And the sticks you'll see today, we're going to use for lots and lots of different purposes. And we'd really appreciate your pictures. If you take pictures of the things you've done and put them in the WhatsApp group as well, that would be really valuable to us. We're going to move on now to activities for young learners. Caroline's got a long loop. 12 in this loop. The activity is play. We're moving on now to activities for lower primary, for four to seven year olds. Now, the children should play with the loop of 12 sticks. This is what Caroline just showed us, the loopy challenge. With paper sticks, you can arrange them like that into a, a loop of, which makes a square with three on each edge but and, you can... and with, with paper sticks it's great with paper sticks if you've got 
two, three, four learners working together on a desk, but I can't, I can't demonstrate it for you here, which is why I've chosen the macaroni. I'll improve it again for next time we do this. But, but at the yeah. moment, it's a question of thinking about little children. And what we're saying here is don't show them what to do. Please don't show them what to do. Which is why Just I want you to tell me the ideas you've got and I'm going to model it using my macaroni necklace. In the chat. So, so can, the you ask, you could, can you ask the questions, Tony, and then I can model it. So the children should play with this loop of paper sticks. Just play with it. And you should be asking questions so you ask, what can you make? What shapes? Don't show them, just ask the questions. And talk about the shapes by name as they make them. So if they've made a triangle, you might say, oh, you've made a triangle. How many edges does it have? And can you make a different triangle? So what we're advocating is free play at first, we're talking about the youngest children. And for even for older children playing with ideas before you are being told exactly what you've got to do, because just by playing you can get quite a good appreciation of whatever the ideas, the topic is, and in this case it's shapes. So there's lots of shapes that you can make with just a loop. And if you've got a loop where, where there, then do the activities and comment on the chat. So at the moment, the activity is play. We're not going to show you or tell you what to do. It's a matter of, for the kids, playing with the um, loop and making different shapes. And then the next thing is, building up their language, helping them to find the right words to describe the shapes they make. So it's not important and imperative that they learn that a pentagon has five sides, but if they've made a five-sided shape, why not? But certainly tell them, but get them to play and only talk about the shapes that they have actually made. So why don't you make some shapes with your loop if you've got one or imagine it, visualize it if you haven't got a loop. And if you want to comment on the chat, if you're teaching young children or indeed I would do this with children of any age. But what we want to emphasize today is the progression of ideas. So we're going to talk about a lesson for a particular age group and you might think you would do it with younger or older children. But to just help you see the progression of ideas today, we're slowly going to introduce different ideas using paper sticks. The emphasis is on paper sticks because they don't cost anything. And, and then when the children have had some experience with the loop and moving on, another lesson, maybe next year or the year after, now we're talking about six or seven year olds perhaps, the children should play with the four triangle puzzle, which Caroline showed you a few minutes ago. So there, yeah, just to yeah, remind I, you. I find that, I find the four triangle puzzle is, you don't present it as a four triangle puzzle. It works well with the younger learners too, just as you say, as free play. Just let them have that, the two triangles that bend together and see what they make with it and give them the extra stick and see what happens. It, there's, and as you say, have the conversations with it. So that's, it's just a nice game for them to play to experience the 2D-ness and the 3D-ness of it. So there's some lessons for younger primary age children and you may use them for different age groups as well. So 
We're going to move on. Tell me, we've got a slight technical problem. I can't... Un oh, yes, it's okay. Mary's unmuted because you're going to be on next. Okay, we're good. Good to go. So we're going to move on next to upper primary and making a meter stick and then using a meter stick. So I hope you're going to be able to see this video. Um, I don't know why there's no, oh, there's no sound because you've no. got your ears, you've got to unplug your Tony? earphones, Tony. It has to come in through the microphone. And then you start rolling and you roll it as tightly as you can to make a stick. And then take some sticky tape and put it round to hold it together. Then cut your stick to exactly one meter and mark at 10 centimeter intervals all the way along. Make marks all around the stick. And at the end piece of 10 centimeters, mark that into centimeter lengths. Uh, Okay, Tony. Um, is Tony muted? We can't hear her. Um, um, I'm just being very quiet at the moment because I'm oh. trying to move to, to make a music stick. No, yes, about sorry, it. sorry Change about that. Paper. Okay, this is the first time we've actually played a video within the presentation. So I think Tony's working out how to move on to the next slide. Okay. Yes, yes, I'm sorry, Mary. It's, um, no problem. No problem. I'm, uh, yeah. And you make it about a meter, a little bit more than a meter. Okay, I don't know why we're having so much problem here. So I'm just going to get share again. And um, meter. Yeah, it needs yeah. two people. It's stop. very different. Stop. Oh, <laughs> bird drinking out. Let me share again. Stop share. And I need to share my screen again. And. Well, Mary, I'm sorry. I'm just and for the people that, if there's anybody who's just arrived, if you could put your name and where you're, where you, where you're from, and the the level of learners that you work with in the chat, that would be very helpful. And also, um, comment. We okay. want you to to make, use the chat, please. Thank you. Well, we're good to go, Mary. Can you see the slide? Yeah. Now? Yes. Now we can see us. Now we can see the slide, Tony. Thank you, thank you. And um, I think it was helpful just being able to see how to actually make the the, the, the meter stick. And um, I just want to give us an opportunity just to maybe type in the chat things that your children could do with this meter stick. What are some lessons? What are some activities that children would do with the meter sticks? Maybe just very briefly, if we could just share. And so, yeah, as, as, we, as we think about um, things that our children could do with the meter stick, um, I think the meter stick, um, even though it's, you're cutting it out, it's a meter, but just for a child having that stick and being able to, you know, go around and, you know, measure things um, and measure them in terms of, you know, how many sticks, you know, they could measure, um, they could measure, they, you could give them things to measure. And I'm still waiting for people to type in the ideas, activities that children would do with the paper stick. And um, 
giving children this opportunity um, really gets to a big idea in mathematics like comparison. Comparison is a, is a big idea in mathematics. Being able to compare, um, compare quantities, compare measures, um, and being a, a big idea in mathematics, specifically when it comes to measuring things, getting children to understand, to get the understanding that length of things can be compared using ideas such as longer than, shorter than. And so this gives children an opportunity to do that. So um, uh, these are some of the things. So the, the, the children would have, would have an opportunity to actually measure. And from that measuring, uh, you notice that the stake are from what Tony shared. The first part you're going to, you know, have you're going to have the a meter measure. The whole stick is a meter long, but then you divide the stick into ten centimeter sections, and the last bit is marked into uh, uh, centimeters. And so that allows um, you to get at the idea of different units of measurement. And um, I think so one one of the important ideas is this whole idea of the different units of measurement. When do you use the, when is it appropriate to use what units? And so as children measure maybe a classroom, and then maybe as they measure the heights of their friends, as they measure things that are smaller, then you could pose questions to them uh, like, you know, which would be a better unit of measurement? What would you use? And then you're able to even get at things like estimation. Estimation, again, is again a big idea in mathematics, um, the ability to estimate. And we um, get into the idea of estimation when um, estimation as an idea is, is, you know, being the ability to be able to approximate measurements and to be able to do an approximation of a measurement uh, that is uh, one of the skills that we need uh, our learners to be able to, to have. And so um, as they measure, the other thing that this kind of activity allows you to do is that you're then able to get to the idea of conversion of units, which comes later, especially for older, it comes uh, not for your very young children, but at a little older age, you get to this idea of conversion of units. And often it's a challenge because then children wonder when I'm converting meters to centimeters, do I multiply, do I divide? And if children have an opportunity to actually measure using the stick and they can even see how the 10 centimeters goes into the big meter stick, then you are able to then get at an idea like um, uh, the longer the unit of measure, the fewer the units it takes to measure an object. So if they have a meter stick and they're measuring a room, if they were using a 10 centimeter stick, then they would need more to measure the room. So you're able to get, uh, if you probably maybe had um, like the 10, 10 centimeter stick separately and you had the meter stick and you told them measure the length of a classroom, and then you told them to now measure the length of the same classroom using the 10 centimeter stick. Then they're able to see that, oh, so I need more 10 centimeter sticks. And so that, that gets uh, the idea, the concept of, you know, if you have a longer unit of measure, then you need fewer units. You need fewer meter sticks. Than Mary, you can, I, can I just interrupt? Um, uh, I'm. I deliberately didn't put anything here about an age group okay. because yeah. all the things Mary's talking about are life skills uh, and they're really important for adults as well as children and uh, I'm not terribly good at estimating lengths and distances. <laughs> you know? So um, it, it isn't easy even for adults. Uh, mm -hmm. When you, in, in my country, when you um, want to get a driving license, you've got to be able to read a number plate at a certain distance, but you've got to know how what that means in terms of, well, how far is it between me and the next car? Mm -hmm. um, scale on maps is also a life skill. And if your learners um, measure themselves, measure with their meter sticks, 
they measure something and then draw a plan of it to scale, they're getting a good idea about something that's extremely important in all sorts of ways in jobs and in, in life. So drawing plans to scale for designing objects or for interpreting information from scale diagrams, all really important. And then collecting data for statistical analysis. So what Mary's been telling, talking about is lots of ideas here, not just for upper secondary, but here there's plenty of scope. Uh, up, oh, what did I say? I made a mistake. I'm so sorry, upper primary. <laughs> but um, but for all, but for different ages as well. So that's that's what we're thinking about using these meter sticks. Another paper stick. But then let's move on to the next one, which <clears throat> we've called Loopy Challenge Two. And Mary, you were going to carry on and talk about this Loopy Challenge Two. Yes, and so um, if you have a loop of of twelve sticks, um, I, I I you you can either use your loop. Um, I made mine um, at some point. I decided to um, to even use matchsticks and join them together, put a string around them. So whatever it is, or if you have just a piece of squared paper, um, just think about all the possible rectangles that you could make that would have a perimeter of 12 units. So just take time and just think about what are all the possible, you know, draw them, use your, your loops to make them, um, and just, yeah, and, and type in the chat, how many have you been able to make? How many rectangles have you been able to make that have a perimeter of 12, uh, of 12 units, 12 sticks? So that would mean you have a rectangle that has a perimeter made up of 12 sticks and one stick is like about 10 centimeters long or whatever you pick as your stick. Yeah. So just a minute, yeah. I'm looking for my. So we're just giving you a moment to think, and if you haven't made sticks, then just sketch them with a piece of paper and a pencil. We're not getting many responses on the chat. Maybe you haven't found the chat. Um, we just would like you to join in, but don't worry if you haven't found the chat, um, as long as you're with us and um, so we've got more challenges here, but there are the three rectangles that have a perimeter of 12 units. Did you find them? Yes. And Tony, may I, may I just point out here that we are thinking about um, very, um, whole numbers when we say 12, so we're, th we're only considering whole numbers because if we were to consider any rectangle that would have um, uh, a perimeter of 12 units we would have infinitely many. So we're, we're only considering whole numbers, you know, our paper sticks. That's right. And, and the, the, the actual challenge here is called wholesome rectangles. And we, we, we tell everybody, we're only looking at whole, we're only working with whole numbers. So what is the area of each of these rectangles? So we're moving from perimeter to area now. Now then, we've got more challenges for you. It's a question of thinking about little children. And what we're saying here is, don't show them what to do. Please don't show them what to do. So the children should play with this loop of paper sticks. Just play with it. And you should be asking questions. So you ask, what can you make? What shapes? Don't show them, just ask the questions. And talk about the shapes by name as they make them. 
So if they've made a triangle, you might say, oh, you've made a triangle. How many edges does it have? And can you make a different triangle? So what we're advocating is free play at first. We're talking about the youngest children. And for even for older children playing with ideas before you are being told exactly what you've got to do, because just by playing, you can get quite a good appreciation of whatever the ideas, the topic is. And in this case, it's shapes. So there's lots of shapes that you can make with just a loop. And if you've got a loop where, where there, then do the activities and comment on the chat. So at the moment, the activity is play. We're not going to show you or tell you what to do. It's a matter of, for the kids, playing with the um, loop and making different shapes. And then the next thing is building up their language, helping them to find the right words to describe the shapes they make. So it's not imperative that they learn that a pentagon has five sides, but if they've made a five-sided shape, why not? But certainly tell them, but get them to play and only talk about the shapes that they have actually made. So why don't you make some shapes with your loop if you've got one, or imagine it, visualize it if you haven't got a loop. If you're teaching young children, or indeed I would do this with children of any age, but what we want to emphasize today is the progression of ideas. So we're going to talk about a lesson for a particular age group, and you might think you would do it with younger or older children. But to just help you see the progression of ideas today, we're slowly going to introduce different ideas using paper sticks. The emphasis is on paper sticks because they don't cost anything. And, and then when the children have had some experience with the loop and moving on another lesson maybe next year or the year after now we're talking about six or seven year olds perhaps the children should play with the four triangle puzzle which Caroline showed you a few minutes ago so there yeah, just to yeah, remind I, you I find that I find the four triangle puzzle is you don't present it as a four triangle puzzle it works well with the younger learners too just as you say as free play just let them have that the two triangles that bend together and see what they make with it give them the extra stick and see what happens it was and you say have the conversations with it so that's it's just a nice game for them to play to experience the 2d-ness and the 3d-ness of it so there's some lessons for younger primary age children and you may use them for different age groups as well. We're going to move on next to upper primary and making a meter stick and then using a meter stick. To make a meter stick use about eight sheets of newspaper and you make it about a meter, a little bit more than a meter and it needs two people, it's very difficult on your own. You, you fold it in three first, and then you start rolling, and you roll it as tightly as you can to make a stick. And then take some sticky tape and put it round to hold it together. And cut your stick to exactly one meter and mark at 10 centimeter intervals all the way along. Make marks all around the stick, and at the end piece of 10 centimeters, mark that into centimeter lengths.
type in the chat things that your children could do with this meter stick. What are some lessons? What are some activities that children would do with the meter sticks? As we think about things that our children could do with the meter stick, I think the meter stick, even though it's you're cutting it out, it's a meter, but just for a child having that stick and being able to go around and measure things and measure them in terms of how many sticks you could give them things to measure. Giving children this opportunity really gets to a big idea in mathematics like comparison. Comparison is a, is a big idea in mathematics. Being able to compare, um, compare quantities, compare measures, um, and being a, a big idea in mathematics, specifically when it comes to measuring things, getting children to understand, to get the understanding that length of things can be compared using ideas such as longer than, shorter than. And so this gives children the, an opportunity to do that. So um, uh, these are some of the things. So the, the, the children would have, would have an opportunity to actually measure. And from that measuring, uh, you notice that the stick uh, from what Tony shared, the first part you're going to a meter, measure the whole stick is a meter long, but then you divide the stick into 10 centimeter sections. And the last bit is marked into uh, uh, centimeters. And so that allows um, you to get at the idea of different units of measurement. And I think so one, one of the important ideas is this whole idea of the different units of measurement. When is it appropriate to use what units? And so as children measure maybe a classroom, and then maybe as they measure the heights of their friends, as they measure things that are smaller, then you could pose questions to them uh, like, which would be a better unit of measurement? What would you use? And then you're able to even get at things like estimation. Estimation, again, is, again, a big idea in mathematics, the ability to estimate. And getting to the idea of estimation, when estimation as an idea is the ability to be able to approximate measurements and to be able to do an approximation of a measurement, uh, that is uh, one of the skills that we need uh, our learners to be able to, to have. The other thing that this kind of activity allows you to do is that you're then able to get to the idea of conversion of units, which comes later, especially for older, it comes uh, not for your very young children, but at a little older age, you get to this idea of conversion of units. And often it's a challenge because then children wonder when I'm converting meters to centimeters, do I multiply, do I divide? And if children have an opportunity to actually measure using the stick, and they can even see how the 10 centimeters goes into the big meter stick, then you are able to then get at an idea like um, uh, the longer the unit of measure, the fewer the units it takes to measure an object. So if they have a meter stick and they're measuring a room, if they were using a 10 centimeter stick, then they'll need more to measure the room. So you're able to get, uh, if you probably maybe had um, like the 10, 10 centimeter stick separately and you had the meter stick and you told them measure the length of a classroom and then you told them to now measure the length of the same classroom using the 10 centimeter stick, then they're able to see that, oh, so I need more 10 centimeter sticks. And so that, that gets uh, the idea, the concept of, if you have a longer unit of measure, then you need fewer units, you need fewer meter sticks. I deliberately didn't put anything here about an age group. Okay. Because yeah. all things Mary's talking about are life skills, uh, and they're really important for adults as well as children. And uh, I'm not terribly good at estimating lengths and distances. <laughs> you know, so um, it, it isn't easy, even for adults. Uh, mm -hmm. When you, in, in my country, when you um, want to get a driving license, you've got to be able to read a number plate at a certain distance, but you've got to know how what that means in terms of, well, how far is it between me and the next car? Um, 
scale on maps is also a life skill. And if your learners um, measure themselves, measure with their meter sticks, they measure something and then draw a plan of it to scale, they're getting a good idea about something that's extremely important in all sorts of ways in jobs and in, in life. So drawing plans to scale for designing objects or for interpreting information from scale diagrams, all really important. And then collecting data for statistical analysis. So what Mary's been telling, uh, talking about is lots of ideas here, not just for upper secondary, but here there's plenty of scope. Uh, up, oh, what did I say? I made a mistake. I'm so sorry, upper primary, <laughs> but um, but for all, but for different ages as well. So that's what we're thinking about using these meter sticks. Another paper stick. The next one we've called Loopy Challenge Two. If you have a loop of of twelve sticks, I decided to even use match sticks and join them together. Put a string around them. So whatever it is, or if you have just a piece of squared paper, just think about all the possible rectangles that you could make that would have a perimeter of 12 units. So just take time and just think about what are all the possible. Draw them, use your, your loops to make them, and type in the chat, how many have you been able to make? How many rectangles have you been able to make that have a perimeter of 12 units, 12 sticks. So that would mean you have a rectangle that has a perimeter made up of 12 sticks and one stick is like about 10 centimeters long or whatever you pick as your stick. So we're just giving you a moment to think and if you haven't made sticks then just sketch them with a piece of paper and a pencil. We've got more challenges here, but there are the three rectangles that have a perimeter of 12 units. We are thinking about whole numbers. When we say 12, so we're, th we're, on we're only considering whole numbers. Because if we were to consider any rectangle that would have a perimeter of 12 units, we would have infinitely many. So we're only considering whole numbers, you know, our paper sticks. That's right. And, and the, the, the actual challenge here is called wholesome rectangles. And we tell everybody we're only looking at whole, we're only working with whole numbers. So what is the area of each of these rectangles? So we're moving from perimeter to area now. Now then, we've got more challenges for you. And again, as Mary says, the question there, imagine making rectangles from loops of different lengths. We're just talking about using these loops, not just what rectangles exist, because obviously there are infinitely many. But what can you do with the loop? And we're going to lead into some number work shortly. Write in the chat how many rectangles you could make with the loop if the, re if the loop had 14 units or 16 or 18. OK, so obviously you haven't got all those, tri those sticks now, but you can think about it. Young children should have lots of practical active experience with loops of paper sticks because that builds number sense, it builds a sense of shape, um, it'll avoid the difficulties that often come with understanding perimeter and area because it'll be so familiar to them from their own experience, not from what the teachers told them and it's gone in their ears but it hasn't gone into their brain but actually from their own activities. But they'll make progress until they don't actually need the loops and they can just think with the numbers. What I've also found, Tony, when I was working with my own loops was the 
it kind of helps one ingrain the properties of a rectangle because the two opposite sides have to be equal. So as, as I was making that, I had to constantly think about that. And I think that's a good thing for children as they do this. It helps to ingrain the properties of a rectangle that the two opposite sides must be equal, the length of the opposite sides. And of course, the fact that the, the right angle. Now, if, if we move on to slightly older children, so can you see now the progression of ideas through primary school and now lower secondary? And here we're going to be talking about working in groups and sharing ideas with other groups. So with this lesson, imagine your class, imagine them making rectangles with loops and each group having a loop of a different length to the other groups. So they're going to do their investigation with their, their one, the one they own, and then they're going to share their discoveries with the whole class. Now, what we suggest is you give each group an even number of sticks and tell them to make a loop with all but one of the sticks. In other words, an odd number. So for the minute, not to use all the sticks you've given them, but to use an odd number, can they make a rectangle with an odd number of sticks? Is it possible to make a rectangle with an odd number of sticks? It's not a trick question. <laughs> the answer is no. Okay. Tell them to add the remaining sticks so their loop has an even number of sticks and to make as many different rectangles as possible with their loop. Okay. So each group has got a loop and they're going to make They've got a loop with an even number of sticks and they're going to make as many different rectangles as possible. Then for each of the rectangles, tell, to, tell them to write down its area and its perimeter. Now, this provides differentiation. The lower tainers can be given loops for numbers that don't have many factors and so have few possible rectangles. And higher tainers can be given loops for which it's more of a challenge to find all the factors. So moving on with that lesson, how will they record their discoveries? So one way is to have a table like this. And then if you see what's happening with four sticks, you need four to make a rectangle. You can make a square with length one, breadth one, area one, perimeter four. So looking at the table, you'll see where it says perimeter, that is the number of sticks in the loop. There, with the perimeter of eight different loops recorded. And you could extend this table on for 20 sticks or 22 or 24 or more. But you see, each group of children have been concentrating on a particular perimeter and they're the experts on the area of their loop. And so the class could share their discoveries and make a poster. Uh, if you have somewhere, if you have a classroom wall where you can put up the children's work, that's so motivating for the children. Imagine this strip going along for older children, certainly beyond 20. And the class could share their discoveries. We want you to think of a whole number. And then Caroline is going to show you about our factor bugs. Now their antennae will show the number and the pairs of legs will show the other factors. My bugs have no legs and no antennae. So what I want you to do is choose one of those numbers. Tony's put the number 10 here, which has got a five and two pair. And of course the antennae 
is 1 and 10. But we've got the number 12. But we want you to understand what a fact a bug. Some bugs have got more legs than others. And the bug for 18, he's got 2 times 9 for one pair of legs and 3 times 6 for the other pair of legs and 1 times 18 for his antennae. So the idea is that if your class is going to make a poster, the table shows the perimeters, but how are they going to show the area? So what they could do is they could draw their factor bugs all round with the arrows showing the area. So the area of 10 goes with the perimeter of 14, and when one pair of factors other than 1 times 10. And the area of 12 goes with both the perimeter of 14 and the perimeter of 16. That's why there are two arrows there. And for some numbers, you'll have more arrows. So I think you can begin to see how the lesson might work out. Uh, some of them won't have any legs at all. They're sort of factor worms, really. And then what, what kind of numbers are the ones that don't have any legs? So they'll all have two antennae. So I can put, well, they'll all have one and Well, one is one, yeah. one, one is rather peculiar. It's the identity and it's rather special. But forget put, one for now. All the rest of the numbers have one times a number for their, 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 um, and their antennae. One times eight okay. and so on. We want the, the legs for the bugs that we don't have legs for, or if you can say which numbers don't have any legs, that would be useful as well. Now you can see how rich this activity is. I mean, it, we, we've been doing area and, um, and perimeter, and now we're into number work. And the children will really enjoy this. Just a question. Yes. Maybe that maybe we might ask children is um, the numbers for which we don't, the bug does not have any legs. Yeah. Um, what does that mean? Can we, what does that mean? Can we form a, tra a rectangle? Can we form if a rectangle we, with the numbers of the bugs that don't have legs? Don't have legs. Yeah. What can we do with the numbers that don't have legs? Yeah. Put in the chat any, num any number you, you can think of where the bug wouldn't have legs. He'd just have his antennae, a worm, if you like. 11 has no legs. And so so we so Faith says 5 has no legs, and you put in 23. So 11 has no legs, 5 has no legs, 23 has no legs. Some others? What other, what other bugs? Oh, Rain has put in some magic words. Prime numbers, yes. <laughs> well done, Raina. So the bugs which don't have any legs, answering Mary's question originally, are prime numbers. And then your learners can show all the factors of the numbers, and that's how many rectangles there will be. When they, when they make the rectangles with the loops. You could do this with upper primary. I mean, we've put 11-year-olds here. 10-year-olds could do this. And it's a lot of fun. And I'm working with one particular 13-year-old who's a bright, bright young man. And there's no reason why it should have happened, but he just did not absorb any of the maths he did in primary school. So I'm working with him with this, this kind of level now so that he's ready to really get into his next year in secondary. So he's 13, he's, he's nearly 14. So there is no, this is a great, this kind of activity is really great for someone who has got left behind or for special needs people as well. And the point is that if you're talking about older children, you can be doing, with them, you can be doing this as a revision lesson. And it's a revision on area and perimeter as well as on factors and prime numbers so it's it's very rich now i think and we have to move on now Tony. it's also assessment for somebody who's new to you oh absolutely that's such an important point it's a way of uh, doing formative assessment and working out what they know and what they don't know and in the process of this 
lesson, um, the lessons that we've been talking about this on um, making a poster and working in groups and so on, they they will learn or remind themselves of things they have forgotten. So I think we need to move on now. Yeah, I just see something. Oops, sorry, Tony. Just back to the previous slide. Um, I, I think I think because this will be a record of what the children have done in the different groups that were working with different perimeters. And so I think having them record and have something like this um, allows you to ask them questions of what they notice. I know one of the things that's coming out is the the factors, the factors, and um, but I think also something like the area as they look at the areas of the of the rectangles for each of the loops, like for the fourteen, let's say the loop of length fourteen. If they look at each loop, you know, which is the biggest area and how does that relate to the breadth and length? Maybe just as something, if they what do they notice about those things like that? Things like you, that you can build up on later um, when they when they get to higher levels. Yeah, and you can use the paper sticks to actually show the area as well. If you build up, if you make a grid in the middle, you can mm -hmm. use the paper sticks to show the area for you know for, for younger learners so they can see it. Now, this Mary, you were going to talk about this one. It's a big. Oh, it's an open question. There are so many answers here possible possible different answers. Yes. So um, this is a very open question. And the, the, the beauty about open questions is that they're accessible to all, all students. Every child can access them. And so uh, let's just put in the chat, um, what shape can we make if we had a loop of 18 sticks? How many rectangles can we make? And going beyond the rectangles, I know we focus so much on rectangles up to this point, but how many triangles can we make? What other shapes can we make? So maybe just take a few minutes. If, if you have your loop of 18 units or even draw, um, try and um, investigate how many rectangles, how many triangles, are there other shapes that we can make with the loop of uh, you 18 units and if you put them on the chat i will do my best to make them with my loop of 18 bits of pasta So just you can just write down numbers in order to show us the lengths of the edges of the shapes. So, for example, if you were making, you might make um, with this. You couldn't make a square, but you could make a hexagon, and it would have, of course, hexagons have six edges, and you could make one where the six edges were all the same. So you could write down three, 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 that is <laughs> three, 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 three. So you can tell us what shapes you're making just by writing down the numbers, which are the lengths of the edges. And the other thing here, if you, you see what I'm making, I'm, I'm going through all the possibilities of a rectangle. Well, I've got two, four at one um, on the width and five on the length. And now I can go to five on the length and four on the width. And the question you can then ask is, well, what's the difference between the two? Do they both have the same perimeter? Do they both have the same area? Does it matter which way round you draw it? 
And shall we move on to different shapes? Shall we move I'm, on? I'm going to make I'm going to make the hexagon you just mentioned. But there's oh, Rena's just given us rectangles. Uh, so let's yeah we have those rectangles. Let's have different shapes, triangles, and if you like other shapes. Um, well, I'm now. What is an a polygon with eighteen sides? <laughs> <laughs> A polygon, an eighteen, an eighteen gone. I bet it's an octodecagon. It's an octodecagon. A decagon. Yeah. If a dodecagon is twelve, then oct octodecagon is is eighteen. Um, well, we are going to move on because it's uh, it's now on the hour. So my clock tells me, and um, we're going to have a break. Now, during this break, well, we want you to have it's a long time to be sitting, listening and participating in a, a workshop like this. So we're going to have a break. Now, um, the question is, what shape loops can we make with 18 sticks? So did you find number triples that wouldn't make triangles? So if you if you tried one, seven, and ten, they certainly add up to 18, but could you make a triangle with those lengths of edges? I like to go to the extreme. I've got one, two, and 15. Will they make, <laughs> <laughs> will they make a triangle? So there are four triangles there that you see all have perimeter 18. And they're different. Each of those four is different. And there are some more triangles. So during the break, we want you to write down numbers that give the other triangles and write them on the chat. Now, nobody managed to contribute to the um, whiteboard at the beginning. So I think drawing on the whiteboard was just a step too far. But I hope you might be able to write the numbers on the chat okay and what i'll do is i'll i'll the one as they get put in i'll record them on here so that you've got a visual of it as well so we can keep track of them all yes but we really want people to have a break so we're not going to do or no, just, yeah thank you caroline that's great that's really wonderful so what we want to do is to just have a five minute break and we will come back in five minutes. And in the meantime, if you want to, you could put down um, any numbers that give triangles that are, have um, a, a perimeter of 18. And if you like, um, then you could put down numbers for the edges of other shapes other than triangles. I've been making discoveries. We had one seven ten, so that's impossible. You can see from the diagram. Why is the particular one that we have here? Why is it impossible to put in the chat? Why this doesn't make a triangle? Or maybe a better question would be, what would we need to do to make it a triangle? Mary, Faith has said you can make six 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 as a triangle and she said you can make five four nine as a triangle that's great faith because what she's done is added to the, the four i drew eight eight two eight seven three seven seven four six eight four and faith has introduced two more wonderful faith they are six 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 and five four nine and then caroline had put in five five eight so that makes seven triangles now what do we do next how do we how do we know whether these numbers will make a triangle or not just a proposal suppose suppose the length that's one if we made that three, what would we end up with? So if we had seven, ten, and three, would that have the same perimeter? 
That would have a longer perimeter, but it's one of my favorite things. Maybe just a minute to see if someone will say why this is not making a triangle. And what is it about the other suggestions that we had in the previous slide and what Faith has suggested and what Caroline has suggested that makes those triangles and yet this is not a triangle. Oh, so Mary's asked us about seven, three and 10. With a square, what if it was a two, one, one triangle? Edge length two, one and one. Why is why would a seven one ten be impossible? Or if we went to a completely different length, why would a two one one be impossible? Or what's going to make it possible to make our triangle? And why have I only got seven of all the many possibilities outlined in pink, which are the only triangles supposedly from all those numbers from an eighteen loop? There's only seven. The 279 is an interesting one. Oh, nobody's, nobody's responding on the chat. I think they, I think, they think that we are um, asking trick questions, but we're not. So to make a triangle, any two edges need to be longer than the third edge. So because 2 and 7 only add up to 9, It'll flatten out. It's a sort of extreme case of a triangle that isn't a triangle. <laughs> Just shorten one and add the length to the other, then you possibly make a triangle. But with our unit lengths, definitely that doesn't work. This is called the triangle inequality. And just in words, to make a triangle, any two edges together to be longer than the third edge. That exercise would be useful even for someone teaching much older children. I think even at, at, at the university level, just to introduce the idea of a triangle inequality. Yes, it's certainly something you could do in a university maths course. It's not that it's difficult, it's just that perhaps if people haven't thought about it before, if they've just been told it, they haven't really understood why. I just remember as something I was taught in school and that never really made any sense to me. It was only when I actually attempted to do it myself in a session like this for adults who were in mass education, that I actually realized, oh, that's what that rule's all about. That's why that rule's the case. Because I was quite confidently making something, okay, seven, three, 10. Yay, I'm gonna make it and, oh. <laughs> okay, I'm like, it'll close, it's a closed loop, no problem. And it was a huge revelation to me, and that was, I was in my 40s by the time I had that revelation. What we're thinking of this evening is a progression in ideas. Mm -hmm. And as you'll notice, it says, paper stick maths lesson for 11 to 18 plus. So now we're suggesting that this puzzle, which Caroline is going to talk to you about, and if you had somebody else in your house who could help you, why is something as simple as this going to be useful for 18 year olds in the year of leaving school? And it is because we're going to go on to talk about with them symmetry and symmetry groups and where you use symmetry, not just at university level, but beyond. So this is definitely not just for babies. However, it's a simple puzzle that you could do with 11 year olds. you needed to make a loop of 12 sticks tied together. Now there's many things you can do with this loop. As you've seen, we've been doing factors and different shape and make with perimeter, area, all kinds of things. Now we're going to do a puzzle. And the puzzle is, we've got to make eight triangles with one loop. And every edge, this is going to be a 3D shape. We're going to make 3D shape. Every edge is going to be the same length. And every edge is only going to be one of the paper sticks. And we've got to make eight triangles. If you've got your loop, go ahead. See if you can make eight triangles. Don't tangle it up too much because you might not be able to untangle it again. Have a go. Go and get somebody quick to help you make eight triangles with one loop. If you can just persuade somebody else in your, in your house to just come and help you for a couple of minutes, you can do something 
rather amazing with the this loop. I'm going to do my best because I don't have anyone here that can help. So I'm going to make the first triangle and then I'm going to make another triangle. And then I'm going to not yet make another triangle. I'm going to make a third triangle. I'm going to join those two triangles to make a third one. And then I'm going to make a triangle so I'm actually making, I've now made a bigger triangle with three of the, of the smaller ones. It's actually it's the beginning of a Spinsky gasket. Now what you've got to do is you've got to put that next triangle on the other end, which is very, very hard for me to do. So here's one I made earlier. And that is the shape that you'll end up making. You can do it, I do it all the time. You don't have to start with triangles, by the way. You can start with squares as well. You can start with any shape you like. That is the shape, I just went straight to it because I don't think it's possible to even do it with two hands. It's lovely for the classroom where you children can work and help each other. It's so it's fantastic it takes a while for them to solve it and oh my goodness you should see their faces when they do solve it and then you can go on to the next level of the maths um, but before we do that we're going to do another puzzle this is a, a fantastic puzzle it's one that Caroline is going we call it poly puzzle we call it poly puzzle because when it's flying that way it looks a bit like a, a parrot flying so it's a, the double triangles that you made earlier you make six of those so you're starting off with 12 triangles and then what we're going to do is we had it there and we had it with the tetrahedron these are all regular polyhedra and they're just the skeletons of them but they represent them and what you'll find in each one of them is every vertex will have the same number of edges or faces attached to it. Every edge is the same length and every face is the same shape. So that is what you need and you're going to take this puzzle, so you're going to first of all get them to make the puzzle which is they love doing, it's a really popular exercise. So first make the puzzle, so you'll have those two like wings and then you've got the, the verticals going down. So whenever you join them together, every vertex is going to have two of one colour and three of another. If you can make them different colours, that's helpful. So every vertex will have five edges. Every face is a triangle, so you're only going to join them together if they're going to make a triangle. And every edge is the same length, that's all right. You make the paper sticks all the same length. Every vertex has the same number of edges. And that you'll always find there's always two going to three. So you can't have... The same amount if you've got five so if you find yourself making a vertex that has more or less than five edges then you've, you've, you've gone wrong and this really helps solidify the concept of a regular polyhedron that ev those are three rules every edge has the same number every edge is the same length every face is the same shape and every ver vertex has the same number of polygons or edges in this case because we've only got the skeleton so I've actually got one I made earlier. When you follow the rule, you will get, I made it much smaller so you can see it from close up, um, you will get an icosahedron, which means 20 faces. And Isn't that beautiful? Caroline, that's lovely. Adding eight just by joining them together. So here you are, and you see Caroline's 30 sticks joined end to end to make a pattern and then joining the triangles to make a solid well a skeleton with triangular faces and 30 edges you can make it into a solid just by wrapping it in in brown paper or newspaper or something you can make it into a solid yes you can stick actually well you don't wrap so much well you can wrap but one way to do it is to cut out the triangles and stick them on the paper sticks and and um and then you then it looks solid it may be papery but <laughs> so uh, so the answer is your 30 sticks make 30 edges and it has 12 vertices you can count them and 20 faces and it's called an icosahedron icos meaning 20 and the hedron 
being about the fact faces. So the word hedron occurs in polyhedron. Polyhedron and polyhedra is, about, is face in Greek. Okay. So now going on, we've got another puzzle which um, starts a little bit more simply than the last one. And with your 12 sticks, you make three squares. And then you use your three squares to make a polyhedron with eight triangular faces. This puzzle is, again, we have to make a polyhedron with eight triangular faces. And it's a regular polyhedron. So what shape is it going to be? You might have seen that before. So the question is, how do you make a, a shape, a polyhedron with eight faces made from three squares? And they must still be squares. And they must, every vertex will have the same number of edges. Every face will be the same a triangle. And every edge is the same length. Well, we've got that control because we've got squares. And every edge is the same length. So how are we going to do it? Well, I've got, them a I've got to set up a little bit in advance here. That's your first clue. That is your clue. You, you're using the diagonals. So you put two squares through each other along the diagonals. Now, if you're doing this in class, let them have a go, let them do different shapes. But one of the rules is that every edge must have only one, every edge must be made out of one paper stick. So what do we do with this other paper, with this other square? And what we do is we put it over the middle. I've got all my little ties here to hopefully I'm going to do that and see if you can do that. If you can just imagine it for a second, I'm just going to tie them up. Well, actually, Car Caroline actually needs the trouble with you, Caroline, is you haven't got four hands. What? <laughs> wrong. Oh, God, can you please fix that for me? Why did you not give me four hands? <laughs> okay, so here's our puzzle, and this is what Caroline is doing. She's making, and, and you could give those instructions if um, you wanted to really help your uh, learners to do this for themselves. And um, the three squares make an octahedron. You've seen that one before. And there it is made with, as you see, the three colors in the picture here, they're uh, red, green, and blue. And what do you notice about it? So notice also, please, that this question of progress on this learning spiral for older and older children, we're now talking about a lesson for 16 to 18 year olds. Although this puzzle, Caroline's often done with primary children, haven't you, Caroline? I do this with all ages. I do this with families, with prim absolutely with primary children. It, you need more. You need more to guide them more with the primary children, and you can do it the same thing every year, and they don't remember from one year to the next. So, <laughs> lessons out of it each year. There you go. I've done it. Look, a lot of geometry here. You know, uh, what are the angles here? Um, what else do you notice about this octahedron? Certainly, it's got twelve edges, six vertices and eight faces. But we're talking about maths for the older children. So we're going to go beyond the obvious. Imagine cutting an octahedron in half. Pam just offered me her hands, Tony. <laughs> what sort of symmetry does that show? The colors help here. If you want to, you could put it in the chat. What can you say about the symmetry in the octahedron? Or symmetries, rather. If you can see what I'm doing, I'm holding it. If that helps you, I'm moving it around to help you visualize it. So we want you to imagine cutting it in half and the top half and the bottom half, OK? And then we're going to go on to talk about other sorts of symmetry. So I'm just showing you these pictures 
with the question. And there's two different sorts of symmetry here. So Caroline is actually going to take her ready-made octahedron. Well, this one, yes, but she didn't manage to make the one that we talked about. So I'm just going to use a pen to show what you want to show. Well, first of all, the colors show you something. They show, oh, Caroline, we, oh, are you, I've stopped sh sharing. Yeah, no, they'll have, yeah. So we want to see, so we want to see you, Caroline, and you can show us, please, um, where where you would cut that in half. Maybe through the yellow square, okay? And it's reflection we're looking for. Symmetry, where the mid, you've got um, three different. Yes, Caroline, that shows it really well. Caroline's hand is acting like a mirror. And you've got a reflection of the top half in the bottom half of your, um, your shape, your octahedron. Now, Caroline, can we show the other sort of symmetry? Can you hold two opposite vertices? Okay, this is a beautiful one made with... Um, I'm not sure what the pen's doing. Can you hold two opposite vertices? Oh, these two, like that. Okay, well, the pen is, is meant to be a sort of axis, and she's rotating this about opposite vertices. If you could lift it up a little... There you are, Caroline. We can see it clearly now. So it's got rotational symmetry. Now, when I talk about symmetry, what I want you to tell me or think about is... How far, what angle do you have to rotate it about for it to look the same, basically? So do a quarter turn and it looks the same. Do another quarter turn and it looks the same again. And another quarter turn and the four quarter turns bring you back to where it started. So it's got rotational symmetry of order four or up for that, um, uh, rotating it by 90 degrees. Now, Caroline, um, could you get hold of two opposite edges and spin it around the two opposite edges? I think, um, yes, all right, spin it, Caroline, hold it up a little higher, lovely. Now, there, now, a half turn now brings it right into the same position and two half turns in the same direction will take it to where it started. All right, so that's half turn symmetry. And the other one which is much more difficult, she's going to show us by going through the midpoints of two opposite faces and that shows symmetry which um, is um, by rotation again, rotational symmetry spinning it or rotating it about the axis and if you rotate it by 120 degrees it comes back to where it started. So those are some of the symmetries of our octahedron and um, Caroline showed it. I hope you, you, you sort of got the beginning to get the picture visualizing that. A really good way of doing it is, is when you get the PDF for this Go ahead and make the shapes and create an axis and it'll get your learners to create an axis and then they can spin it for themselves and really get their heads around it and look at it from all different angles and see, see the, the order of symmetry. So symmetry is a hugely important idea and you'll see a bit later on um, how it's um, you know cutting edge research and everything in, from school primary school where you first learn about reflection and rotation right through university, right into scientific research. So this is why we're introducing this for um, suggesting anyway that it, it could be a good lesson for 16 to 18 year olds um, and uh, to use paper sticks means you actually you don't have to visualize it which is really hard you can actually do it and see what happens. So, 
There you see at one of the AIMSEC courses, you can see the teachers who are on that course. The picture on the left shows you the, with the puzzle that Caroline has just shown you. That's the, what we call the poly puzzle. And the picture on the right shows you what they they made with that poly puzzle and they look I must say they look very pleased with what they've managed to make. So Caroline's going to show you how you can just make a display with these polyhedra. These are the five regular polyhedra that you've just seen. You've got the tetrahedron, you've got the cube or hexahedron, you have the octahedron, the dodecahedron and the icosahedron. Those are the only five regular polyhedra that exist. The next question is, what shapes are rigid and what shapes collapse? Let's take the tetrahedron and attempt to make it collapse. And you can't, it stays rigid. It holds its shape. The next one has six faces and it, they're all squares and they collapse down. And that's a whole session that we do using a bendy cube. It completely collapses, it doesn't hold its shape. Whereas with the triangle, the shape does not change. The next one is the octahedron, made out of triangles, and it doesn't collapse. And look at the dodecahedron, it completely collapses. It doesn't hold its shape at all. The icosahedron, again, has got rigidity. So what is the common property between the three rigid shapes? And we're always looking for patterns in mathematics. So that's a great activity, a great thing to always be asking what's common, what's different, what's the similar, what's the pattern? Has anybody spotted the common property between icosahedron, octahedron and tetrahedron? This is really important in structural engineering. If you're going to make, you're going to make structures uh, like a bridge, for example, you've got to be aware of the fact that the triangles are going to make things strong and rigid. Mary, you're going to challenge people with about these codes. So we have some regular polyhedra here, beautiful pictures. And um, for the tetrahedron, the code is 333. So you can see for each of the polyhedra there, you're given a code. And um, let's see if we can decipher the code. What does that 333 mean? Three mean. So you could think about it and just put in the chat what you think the code means. So for the cube, it's four, four, four. For the tetrahedron, it's three, three, three. So what is the fourness of the cube and the threeness of the tetrahedron? Indeed, what is it about the octahedron and the icosahedron? that involve the number three. Well, it's the triangular faces. We just heard about that from Pam. And the dodecahedron is five, five, five. And this football, which has got a pentagon with five sides, surrounded by five hexagons. So at each vertex, there is one pentagon and two hexagons. And now if you go on, you can see more shapes, more pretty pictures. And can you see sitting in the middle there, there is of the semi-regular polyhedra, there is this football arrangement again, right? With the hexagons around the pentagon. So the hexagons have six edges and the pentagon has got five edges. So that's why the football shape, which is 665, which is sometimes called a buckyball shape, um, and it, uh, it crops up in crystallography as um, an important shape for crystals. You might like to look at some of the other shapes on the right there. What about the one on the, the top left-hand corner there 
which has triangles and octagons in it. Can you see the one I'm talking about on the, just under the word semi, right? It's made up of triangles and octagons. We've got a comment that says the number of digits represents the number of edges meeting at the vertices. It, that is numbers, yes. The numbers are the digits, if you like. It's 444 because they're squares, and for the one I just talked about, it's 883 because they're octagons and they're triangles. So it's describing the shapes that meet at each vertex. It's actually what we call the vertex structure. The code tells you the vertex structure. So at every vertex of a semi-regular polyhedron, you have the same vertex structure so look at the one on the top right that's red, yellow, and green. What's used to make that one? The red, yellow, and green one up under the A of polyhedra. Can you see it's squares and a triangle? Yeah, so yeah. what would the code be for that? Maybe a beginning question would be how many digits would be in the code? For that one. Caroline has written 883 by the one on the, um, the, the one there that we spoke about a minute ago. And Mary's asking how many digits in the code. Think about the code for the one that's just under the A of polyhedra. Now, this is a lovely one to give to a class and actually ask them to do it in groups and then they can have, they've got lots to talk about talking about the shapes uh talking about how many edges the shapes have and talking about the what's happening at each vertex and then about the code and there's a question mark above the one have you got it um somebody's written oh well done four 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 three how, how many okay. Are there, how many are, there, are there four are there four squares or how many squares are there there? Um, how many squares on that one where there's a question where you see a question mark and how many triangles at each vertex? There's two green squares and a red square on a yellow triangle at each vertex. So that is a four, four, three. Well, we are going to move on now, but I think you can see that this is a fun puzzle to work out, but actually you could start off the other way. I, I once did this at a camp with very small children. Well, so sort of nine years and up, about nine to nine to 14, that sort of age group. Sorry, sorry Tony, just it's uh, the comment is it's four squares around one triangle. It isn't about what's around the triangle, it's about what's touching every vertex. It's the vertex structure, it's what's happening at the vertices. Okay, and once you got hold of that, it becomes really clear what happens at each vertex. So for the buckyball or football, it's a 665, and for the one at right at the top right hand corner it's a four four three and you can see the others so i once did this with younger children and they learnt the vertex structure and then they went to the box and got the pieces they were plastic pieces they got the pieces and made it just knowing the vertex structure nothing else they didn't have a picture they just had the vertex structure so there you go so that's something that you might like to think about. Now we're going to move away from school and we're going to move now to the world of um, research and just think very quickly about, very briefly for a short time, about how this maths that we teach in school is used out there in the real world. Well, so many different ways, but we're just going to talk about this particular idea of symmetries and then one of the ways it's used is in crystallography. So those two pictures you will see 
represent the same molecule, but their labeling on them shows you rotational symmetry with the red arrows showing you how you rotate that and oh, you can rotate it and the picture on the on the right shows you reflection symmetry um, we don't have to understand the detail just get the general idea and there's a magazine you might like to look at and that's uh, on an online magazine it's called plus and there's two articles there you might if you have time like to read them one is through through the looking glass and the other one's shattering crystal symmetries and they explain really beautifully how group theory how symmetry groups how they occur in packing crystals together so it's important for your school children to realize that mass is really important and what they learn at school is going to be used in fact there's a lot more to learn but it's going to be used in in life in all sorts of ways and another way is particle physics now I'm told by my friends who are physicists particle physicists that it's all about it's all about symmetry groups, okay? Particle physics, apparently, so the experts tell me, is all about symmetry groups. Now, this is a, don't know this story, it's really important story to think about. Peter Higgs, way back in 1964, predicted a part, new particle, nobody had seen one, and he just used mathematics and a knowledge of physics. And he said there was this, this particle did exist. Now there's a research center in, in Switzerland called CERN, C-E-R-N, and there's a, a large hadron collider and they do experiments and they shatter bigger particles and they make smaller particles. Just as much as I understand about what they do. It's a particle accelerator. So it makes the particles go really, really, really fast, and it's got a huge radius. It's like it would go all around the, the, the outside of Johannesburg, underground. Um, it's huge, and it's all underground, this tunnel underground. The magnetic field cause the particle to get faster and faster and faster and faster until they collide with each other, and then these, these new particles happen. And so Peter Higgs had predicted way back in 1964, and people didn't really believe it, but he said, the mathematics tells me that there's a particle, and this is how you describe it, by its symmetries. And then in 2012, they found his particle, and then it was celebrated in the physics world, the maths world. He was right all along, and Higgs and Englert were awarded a Nobel Prize in 2013, something which Higgs had predicted just using maths in 1964. But then I found this article um, just a few weeks ago. In March this year, what does it say? CERN is celebrating, they just announced the discovery of four brand new particles at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. Um, so they found a total of 59 new particles in addition to the Nobel Prize winning Higgs boson. And there you are. It's mathematics that's the power behind the physics. And um, so aren't we proud of our mathematics? There are the links but we'll be de we'll be circulating these links so that you will have access to them you'll see that there are lots of different learning packs on the MEI website and eight different videos on the AIMSET YouTube channel called Math Toys that you can use to um, <laughs> to explore the possibilities of all everything we've done today and more using paper sticks 
if you want to contact Ames, Ames Sec, then it's very easy, admin at aimsec.ac.za. If you want to sign up for a self, as a self-funding student to do one of our courses, um, they are three-month courses all online, um, then we'd welcome you to join us, um, but you need to inquire from admin at aimsec.ac.za.